Well, let me just begin by reading the one verse that we're going to look at, which is a rather full verse, and uh, I'm not even going to, well, by any means, exhaust it this morning. I'm not even sure if it's possible to exhaust any part of um, God's Word. The Puritans, if they've showed us anything, they've shown us that um, you can spend a lot of time in any one text. I'm looking at a commentary on the book of Job back there that I think spans 10 or 12 volumes, and I think... The man who expounded it, um, Joseph Carroll, spent 30 years (laughs) preaching in the book of Job. And yet, I'm sure by the time he was done, he had preached the entire Bible uh, because it is all connected. So we're not going to exhaust this verse, but we are going to look at some of the things it has to say. So this is the verse we're focusing on, verse 35, where Jesus concludes basically this paragraph. And he says, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. And if I may add verse 36, be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. May the Lord bless His Word to our hearing this morning. Now, I think, um, I think we would all agree that one of the more difficult things, perhaps the most difficult thing the Lord calls us to do as His children is to love our enemies. And when you stop and think about it, sometimes we find, find it, it's hard to love even those who are closest to us, really in the way that we should. I mean, to love our parents. And think about all the reasons why we should love our parents, because they sacrifice so much to raise us and to take care of us and to protect us in this life. How difficult sometimes it is to love our natural brothers and sisters, the ones that we grew up with. Uh, How difficult sometimes it is to love those that we've entered into a marriage covenant with, to um, keep those vows. Remember, we promise to love one another, and sometimes, well, oftentimes we, we fail to love the children that the Lord has blessed us with, to love the brothers and sisters that God has given to us when He brought us into the family of Christ. I mean, sometimes our love, even for those that we have the most reason, as it were, to love, can grow thin. And yet our Lord calls us to love them. To love those that we don't know at all can be even more of a challenge, I think to reach out to those who are in need around us, to be a good Samaritan to everyone. You know, to those who have lost their homes and are out on the streets, the orphan who has lost its parents, the widow who has lost her husband. And yet, that's what the Lord calls us to do, to be a good Samaritan to everyone around us. But I think to love those who have injured us in some way, to love those who don't like us, maybe even hate us, is much more difficult. More often, I think, we find ourselves wanting to retaliate, wanting to hurt them, rather than wanting to help them. But our Lord tells us He wants us to love them as well. And again, maybe I can just preview what I said before. He doesn't want us to be enamored with them. It's not that they're going to draw out our love because they're so lovely and we love the way they hate us and we love the way they hurt us. But rather, He wants us to extend a a a great deal of love towards them, to be kind towards them, even as the Lord is. Now, this morning, I want us to look at five reasons from our passage, not only why we should do this, but why we should try to do our very best in doing this. Uh, Let me just give you those five reasons, and then we'll look at them one at a time. The first and the most obvious one is that this is what Jesus calls us to do. Secondly, because this is what the Father does. That's what we've been focusing on up to this point. This is what Jesus does as He shows us or reveals the Father to us. He isn't calling us to do something that He Himself is not willing to do. He's calling us to do it because He does it. Thirdly, because when we do this, we show that we really are His children. We share His nature. Fourthly, because God says He will not only reward us, but greatly reward us for doing this. And then fifthly, let's not forget, we should do this because that is what He did for us. 
That's what the table reminds us of. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, first of all, we should love our enemies because this is what Jesus tells us to do. And, of course, whatever Jesus tells us to do is always right, but it's also something we should always listen to because He is the Lord. He says in our passage, and I am going to read this several times, and notice the first words, but love your enemies. That, that's a command. And do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. I'll, I'll just stop there. I'll, I'll emphasize different parts of it as we go through. Our Lord, who has the right to tell us what to do, tells us to love our enemies and obviously being His servants. That is what we must do. Jesus said in this same section to His disciples, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I think the implication is if He is the Lord, then we must do what He says. You know, that whole Lordship of Christ controversy? Do we have to obey Him or do we not have to obey Him? Well, I hope you know the answer to that question. We do, of course, obey Him. Now, let me just say that it is, yes, it is true that Jesus loves us even when we fail Him. It's true that Jesus has promised that He's never going to let us go no matter what happens. It's true that He is going to bring us to heaven, and as Paul says, there is nothing in heaven or earth that can possibly separate us from His love and nothing that can stop Him. We are secure in Christ. In other words, we can fail, and we will still be His, and we will still go to heaven if we belong to Him. But the point here is we should never use His love for us as an excuse to allow ourselves to fail. We should use His love as a reason to obey. The Lord is the Lord of our hearts, you see. He is the one we love more than any other. And He calls us to love our enemies. And so we should seek to do this with all of our love, with all of our hearts because of our love for Him. Now, secondly, we should love our enemies because that is what our Father does. Again, Jesus says in Luke 6, 35. I'll read the whole verse this time because it comes at the end. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Jesus says, you do this because your Father does this. Now, we know that God originally made man good. We know that man originally shared God's love for everything that is good, for everything that is right, that man originally walked with God in holiness, and he enjoyed it. And he thanked God for every single one of those blessings that he received on a daily basis in the garden. It was a, a place of tremendous blessing. But we also know the fall changed all of that. Instead of being thankful any longer, man became ungrateful. Instead of sharing God's nature, His holy nature, man became evil. Now, this word evil in the Greek, I think, is, is really uh, revealing because of what it actually means. It refers to those who are characterized by ill will. It means evil. It means wicked it means malicious, okay? This is the kind of person that God is kind to. You know that this word is actually the same word that Jesus uses to describe the devil. In John 17, verse 15, where he's praying in his high priestly prayer, he says, Father, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one, from the wicked one, from the malicious one. John, in 1 John 5:18 uses it the same way. We know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who was born of God keeps him, that is, Jesus keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. That word evil is used to refer to, to us before we came to Christ. It's used to refer to the people 
who are in this world. Man was good. God made him good. But through the fall, he's more like the devil now than he is like God, which is why man hates God and he loves evil. Listen to what Jesus says in John 3.19. And again, this is a commentary on everybody who is outside of Christ. He says, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. Man is evil because of the fall. Man is ungrateful because of the fall for God's mercies. Paul writes in Romans 1.21, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. So instead of loving God and thanking Him for all of His mercies, they hate Him and they do not give Him thanks. I think Paul's commentary in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, is a good summary of man's condition. And again, this describes the kind of people that God is kind to. He says, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Do you want to understand fallen man? We have to understand it from what the Bible says. And, of course, this, the fall, is why he hates God so much. I couldn't resist adding this verse as well or these few verses. In Romans 8, verses 6 through 8, Paul writes, <clears throat> For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. How can you please God when you hate God? Now, if we were to read the whole chapter, we would understand that those who are in the flesh are those who are outside of Christ, those who don't have the Spirit of God dwelling in them, uh, those who have the Spirit in them, the law of God's being fulfilled in them, those who, are, who don't have the Spirit are in the flesh, and those who are in the flesh hate God, and they will not submit to the, His law. So essentially, look at the Ten Commandments. They are breaking every one of them in the face of God, who is infinitely holy and infinitely worthy to be praised. Now, I would grant you that it's, it's, that it's true that the world may not appear that it hates God this much, but neither did the, the Jews appear to hate God. Or, you know, the leaders of the Jews or the people of the Jews before Jesus came, it seemed like everybody was looking with expectation for Messiah to come and even longing for His coming. And then when He comes... What happens? They hate him. They reject him. They falsely accuse him. They condemn him. They hand him over to the Romans in order to be executed. That's how much the Jews loved Jesus. Now, man only thinks he loves God. I mean, if you ask most people who believe in God, they'll probably tell you that they, that they love him. They think they love him. But they only think they love him until God actually shows up and reveals himself to them. And then they actually see what is really in their hearts, just like the Jews. They thought they loved God, but when God appears in human flesh, they actually hate him. Not everyone. Those, of course, that the Lord had mercy on received him and they embraced him, but the vast majority of them rejected him. Now, by the way, that's also why so many people seem to be at peace with God until you share the gospel with them. Oh, yeah, I believe that. So you've trusted Jesus as the only way of salvation. You've turned from your sin. Don't, don't give me that religious stuff. I, I don't want to talk about it. You know, they'll talk about it at a certain level, but when they come face to face with God, they see that they really do not love Him, but rather have the heart that the Bible says they have. And yet, in the face of all this hatred, God reveals His love to mankind, and again, I would make that distinction. It's not that He's enamored with it, but that He is out of the fullness of His own heart showing tremendous love towards mankind. We've already read about it in Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9. The Lord is gracious and merciful, 
slow to anger and great in loving kindness, the Lord is good to all, and His mercies are over all His works. The psalmist writes in Psalm 103, verses 13 through 15, He waters the mountains from His upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of His works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the labor of man so that He may bring forth food from the earth and wine which makes man's heart glad so that he may make his face glisten with oil and food which sustains man's heart. You know, when Paul and Barnabas were, were breaking new ground and they're going out to the Gentiles and they're preaching Christ, he, he draws upon the goodness of God to, uh, well, to show them why it is God does what he does and it was in order that they might actually come to know him. In Acts 14, verses 16 and 17, when they're preaching to the Gentiles at Lystra, he says this, in the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, and yet he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. This is what God did for those who hated him, for those who basically reduced God to a creature or who worshiped false gods and wanted nothing to do with the true God, God was still kind to them. Now, the Lord not only provided in this way for His enemies, but as we saw again before, He even gave His Son so that they might be reconciled to Him. Jesus says in John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. To a world that hated Him, He sent His Son. We already saw what, what the world did with the Son, but that was necessary in order to save us. But ultimately, He sent His Son into the world so that people like you and I, who have trusted in Him, might Worship Him on earth, serve Him on earth, glorify Him on earth, and then be with Him forever in heaven. But let's not forget, when He came to us, we were in the world. This is what we were like. And yet, God still showed His love toward us. So, we are to love our enemies because our Father loves His enemies. Now, thirdly, and these last three points are going to be briefer, He says we are to love our enemies because through the new birth, that is really what we want to do. Through the new birth, we share His nature, because now we are His children. Again, Luke 6, 35. Jesus says, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. When we do what it is the Lord calls us to do, and we do it because we want to do it, it shows what we really are. It shows the true condition of our hearts and our true relationship with God, that we really are His children. And that's shown, of course, by the fact that we love Him enough to do what He's calling us to do. Jesus says in John 14, 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. I just want to again repeat here that we do not become the children of God by obeying this commandment, but through our obedience we actually show ourselves to be his children, that we are His children, that our lives have been transformed by the Spirit, the Spirit of adoption, the Spirit of sonship that Jesus came to give us, the one He has sent into our hearts by His grace and His mercy. So Jesus commands us to do this. We are to do this because the Father does this. When we do this, we show that we are truly born again, that we are the children of God. Fourthly, we should do this, we should love our enemies because the Lord says that if we do this, our reward 
will be great. Jesus says in Luke 6.35, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. Now, you know, the Lord tells us that everything that we do for Him is certainly going to be rewarded. But this in particular, Jesus singles out. If you do this, you will not only be rewarded, but greatly rewarded. Now, we might ask the question, why? Why does he single this particular thing out? And I think it's because when we do this, we are actually reflecting his nature, his image, and his glory more than just about anything else we can do. And I think this is the kind of witness, this is the kind of example the Lord wants us to show others so that they might come to know Him. Now again, that reward comes in many different forms. Certainly the Lord is going to reward us more here, I think, with more of His presence, more of His likeness, but I think we will also be able to expect a greater reward when we get to heaven if we love our enemies. And then finally, we should love our enemies because God loved us when we were His enemies. Now, here we go outside of the text, but it's certainly implied in our text. But Romans 5.10, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. We should do this because God did it for us, because Jesus did it for us while we were his enemies. God sent his son. While we were his enemies, Jesus laid down his life for us. Now, we need never to forget that the only reason why we have this relationship with God, the only reason why we have a future, the only reason why we have a hope is because he was willing to love us while we still hated him. Now, again, I would just tell you, we may not have thought we hated him, but the Bible says we did, and perhaps we weren't exposed to the things that would have revealed that hatred, but as a matter of fact, that was the case. So, as those who have been shown mercy, our Lord now calls us to show mercy so that others, too, might find His mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, on this particular point, I do want to enlarge, I think, this evening, and that is how we are to love our enemies, and we might again consider why, because this is what the Lord uses, perhaps more than anything else, to bring people to Him. We need to be willing to do that. We need to be able to do it. We can only be able, of course, through the Holy Spirit. Only Jesus can give us this kind of love. It's a supernatural love, but it is a love that stops traffic, that makes people pay attention. I think uh, there's numerous examples where when Christians were persecuted and they retaliated with love, that it became a witness to those who saw it, and actually they were converted. The Lord used that to convert them. So we have received mercy. I'm, I'm looking at this mainly as one of the uh, the motives, one of the reasons why we should do it is because God had mercy on us. He showed us this mercy when we were His enemies, and so He wants us to imitate that. He wants us to show other people this mercy, and I think for the same reason, in order that they might come to know Him. Now, let me just simply close by saying this, that if you haven't received Jesus, you do need to realize that all this kindness that the Lord shows to you was that you might turn from your sins, from your fight, your warfare with Him, and be reconciled to Him. Remember what Paul and Barnabas said to the Gentiles at Lystra? He didn't leave Himself without a witness. He gave you these fruitful seasons. He's been good to you. And, and why has He done that? What is this witness supposed to be of? What's well, that God is kind, God is gracious, God is good, God is willing to be reconciled if you will come to Him through His Son. That's the reason why people that are in this world and why we, when we were in the world, 
receive these good things from God. If God had a bullwhip on our back the entire time and was terrorizing us and so forth, it's likely that that wouldn't have been as effective in bringing us to Him because we would have this impression of Him that He's some kind of an evil tyrant, but God is good. And He's expressing this kindness and this goodness, and it's meant to lead us to repentance. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans 2, verse 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Paul says that's the reason why the Lord shows what He does by way of kindness is that it might lead you to repentance. So let me just encourage you this morning, if that should be the case with you, do not take His kindness for granted and do not mistake His kindness for, for thinking that God somehow is pleased with you and that everything is okay. God is kind to ungrateful and evil men, the Bible says. His kindness is not a mark of His love and ownership towards us or that everything is okay and that He's going to receive us on the day of judgment. It is meant to lead you to His Son who warns you that you must turn from your sins. You must give up your warfare. You must trust in Jesus. You must love Him. You must follow Him. One day the Lord's kindness is going to come to an end. And if you haven't received Jesus by that time, you will have to face His judgment. So rather than that, let His kindness instead lead you to the repentance, to the salvation which He intends that is in His Son, the Lord Jesus. Well, let's, um, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's ask the Lord to um, speak to our hearts, to apply what we've heard, and to encourage us to do what it is that He would have us to do.